Hello from San Antonio. This is Siren Tayro. Sinistry K no comprende. So I speak English. I try to speak Spanish, but I don't speak Spanish fluently. But I use Spanish at my channel a little bit because Spanish is my favorite language. I live in San Antonio, Texas. I was born in Bridgeport, Texas on February 17th, 1973. I was born at 629 p.m., which means I have Sun and Venus and Aquarius, Virgo rising, Virgo moon, Mars, Jupiter, North Node, Vertex, and Capricorn, etc. So, Sinistry, K, no comprende. First in a series. I put up a thing at my community, my community tab, my community section. I put up a thing saying that I was going to make this video because I had this epiphany the other night. I was falling asleep under the influence of Benadryl. The allergies are hell in San Antonio. I was falling asleep and I had this epiphany. I've made other videos on how I see the moon and Mercury as the keys to sinistry. I still do. But to add to that, I feel like you should look at your chart ruler and its tightest aspect. I've been studying astrology since I was a kid, but I didn't get deep into it until I found this astrology forum online. In 2014, I was in a really fucked up place. I was trying to get over a man that I had been on again, off again with for years. A man I regard as the love of my life. I've never felt romantic sexual love that intensely with anyone else. So anyway, I said, okay, I've been married and divorced twice. I've lived with five different men. My emotional life has been a train wreck. I've got to figure this out. So I spent a lot of time at this astrology forum, asked questions, got feedback, paid for a telephone consultation with a very seasoned uh, pro astrologer. And she shed some insight on my natal chart, but it wasn't to my satisfaction. So I said, I'm going to have to figure this out myself. This is my chart. I've got to figure it out. So I spent hours upon hours at astro.com studying my chart and looking at my synastry with all my exes, especially the ex that I had the deepest feelings for, the, the ex that I was on again, off again with. So I went to merriamwebster.com and wrote down their definition of synastry. Sinistry, concurrence of starry position or influence upon two persons, similarity of condition or fortune prefigured by astrology. My definition of sinistry, how does your stuff interact with their stuff? How much do they like your stuff? How much do you like their stuff? How long is it going to last? Because when I'm talking about the keys to sinistry, talking about the moon and Mercury and now the chart ruler, what I'm talking about is lasting success, not a hit it and quit it, not someone that you're going to be on again, off again with for a couple of years and it just goes up in flames. I'm talking about something substantial and solid that lasts. That's all that I'm interested in in my late middle age. I've done all the other stuff. Um, I had really good Mars Venus with all of my exes, especially my two ex-husbands. Um, my second ex, my son's father, you can't have much better Mars Venus than what we have. His Mars and Leo tightly opposes my Venus and Aquarius. That's quite hot. And it was very hot in the beginning when we first were getting to know each other, having sex. But eventually it fizzled out. There wasn't enough support in our synastry from the other planets. We don't have Moon. We don't have Mercury. Now when I'm talking about these aspects, and I'm going to ramble. I've got Mercury and Pisces. I don't have a script. I'm just rambling here, but 
I'll come back to the points that I want to make eventually. I don't want to do another take. This is take three or four. I've got a dry erase board somewhere. I should find it, I guess. I've got these notes. Okay. Back to... Let's go back to 2014. When I was looking at my sinistry with my ex, the one that I had the strongest feelings for. Okay. We do have moon sinistry. Oh, when I'm talking about the aspects between the keys to sinistry, the moon, mercury, chart ruler, I'm only looking at the major aspects. You know, a lot of astrologers would say that uh, the inconjunct, the quincunx, those are major aspects. I don't. And I've had a book, I had a book at some point on the, uh, the quincunx, the inconjunct. For example, if you've got your Venus at 16 Aquarius and your partner has his Mars at 16 Cancer, that's an inconjunct. I don't look at those. I look at the conjunction, the opposition, the trine, the sextile, the square. Those five, the big hitters. Because what I'm interested in is lasting success in a romantic sexual relationship. Nothing minor, nothing that's going to fade away after a couple of years. I take this very seriously. So, my sinistry with the man who affected me the most, and I thought, you know, why? Why did he have such an impact on me? Because anyone who would meet us in person, anyone who would look at our social media profiles, I don't have any social media. I have YouTube and that's it, LinkedIn and that's it. I don't have Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. But say I had a Facebook profile and he has a pre Facebook profile and if someone was to go and look at our profiles or just to meet us in person, they would not put the two of us together. We're not an obvious match. Um, different ethnicities. I don't think that really matters, but uh, I'm white. He's Latino. Some people focus on such things, but he's 15 years older. He was born in the 50s. I was born in the, he was born in the late 50s. I was born in the early 70s. Um, we just are very different. He was raised Catholic. I was raised Baptist. I no longer consider myself a Christian. He is a Christian. He does believe in heaven and hell. Um, we're just very different in many ways. So I thought, why? Why did he have such an impact on me? Uh, I'm hyper creative. I'm always creating. I've got numerous YouTube channels. Uh, this is the only monetized channel that I have. At my main channel, the channel that I started New Year's Eve 2010, I uploaded my first video New Year's Eve 2010. I have 170 subscribers there, and it's all random creative content. I've got an electric guitar and an amp in the garage. I still need to learn at least a few chords, at least a couple of chords, three chords on that damn guitar. I'm always writing. I've got books at Amazon. Um, I create art. I'm always uploading designs to Redbubble. And this man, who I regard as the love of my life, he's not really creative at all. So, studying our sinistry, I soon found out that one of the main things is he has his Pluto in Virgo and my moon in Virgo. I've talked about that aspect in my channel numerous times. If you have moon Pluto with someone, it's going to be intense. Usually the moon person feels it more intensely than the Pluto person. The Pluto person tends to have the power uh, because the moon person usually, typically, falls hard and fast for the Pluto person. And the Pluto person doesn't really feel it. They get off on the power. They get off on having that much power over the moon person. That was certainly the case with me and my ex. 
Uh, he had the power. I wanted him more than he wanted me. I felt our love with intensity, and he didn't feel the intensity. So, there was that. His Pluto in Virgo on my moon in Virgo. Our Mars Venus is pretty minimal. His Mars in Sagittarius makes a very wide sextile to my Venus in Aquarius, so that doesn't really count for much. Our moons make a very wide trine. Mercury, our Mercury's don't play well with each other. He's got his Mercury in the late degrees of Sagittarius. My Mercury is at 14 Pisces in the 7. So, back to this epiphany that I had. There's always going to be noise in the background. It can't be avoided. These YouTubers who have the perfect setup with the lighting and, I don't know, they're in some kind of studio, some kind of well-furnished, well-lit room, and there's no noise in the background. I don't get it. I'll probably never have that. But this is my life. And I want to make this video. I don't want to do another take, so let's just trudge on. Okay, this epiphany that I had. It may only apply to me. I don't think so. But that's why I put out the call for people to send me their data so that I could talk about other charts and see if my theory is correct. But... The reason why my chart ruler is so important is because it's in my seventh house, the house of marriage partnership. So I'm going to go over my stuff and then I chose a chart to go over for this first video. I received well over 30 emails from subscribers giving me their information. This is going to be first in a series. so. I want to explore other charts and talk about them. I'm not going to use names. I'm just going to refer to people as the Aquarian or the Scorpio or whatever. Um, I'm not going to use names because people may come back and they may change their mind and not want their names associated with my videos, whatever. So I'm not going to use any names. Um, I'm going to go over my chart and break it down, just the stuff that I think is crucial for synastry, the Moon, Mercury, Chart Ruler. And then I'll go over the subscriber's information. Okay, so I'm trying to talk like a teacher or like I'm talking to people who are absolutely beginners when it comes to all of this who don't know any of this stuff. I don't want to talk over people's heads. I get complaints sometimes at my channel that I talk about astrology too much. That's not going to change because I'm very passionate about astrology. Um, but I'll make these videos as supplements to my pick a card so if people are curious about what I'm talking about, they can watch these videos and there's a wealth of information at YouTube, all kinds of astrology videos. Recommended reading. I just got this. I've not read it. I've skimmed it, but it's very good. Good reviews at Amazon. The Twelve Houses by Howard Sassportis. This is a classic, and he explains what the Twelve Houses mean. So, your first house, that's your ascendant, the sign that was rising at the time of your birth. So for me, it's Virgo. I've got Virgo rising. I've got this on a note card thumb tap to the wall. The angular houses, the first, the fourth, the seventh, and the tenth, houses one, four, seven, and ten are the strongest influences in the chart. One, that's your ascendant. Four, so one is the house of Aries. Four is the house of Cancer. Seven, the house of Libra. Ten, the house of Saturn. And that's my mutable grand cross. I've got the tattoo. I've shown this before. Saturn at the top, because I've got Saturn in the 10th. Neptune in the 4th. Moon in the 1st. Moon in the 1st. Mercury, my chart ruler, in the 7th. So, I was falling asleep the other night, and I thought, 
Yes, the moon and Mercury are crucial, but the chart ruler and its Titus aspect are going to provide further clues. Um, why does this man still have so much power over me? We've been apart for almost five years. Haven't seen each other since 2019, and that was very minimal. Um, and this is what I arrived at. Okay. So, your first house is important. Anything you have in your first house, it's going to be amped up. Uh, because that's your most visible house. When people first meet you, they see your first house. Why? Because that's your ascendant. So it confused me for years when I didn't really know astrology. I wasn't deep into it. I thought, how can I be an Aquarian? Because Aquarians are so out there. They're outrageous. They don't care what anyone thinks. They're just themselves, balls to the wall. They're fearless. Uh, they have lots of friends. I was always shy. I had a very few, very few friends. There were times when I was a loner. I had no friends at all. I was very shy. I was very um, self-conscious. Well, I've got Virgo rising. And Aquarians, typically, the textbook definition for Aquarians is that they're like androids or robots. They have no feelings. They're not emotional. Of course, that's not true. We all have emotions. But that never really rank true for me. I have my moon in the first house. So if you have your moon in the first house, you're going to be more like a cancer. Um, you're going to be more sensitive. You're going to be more emotional if you have moon in the first house. So I have moon at six degrees Virgo in the first house. I've got Mercury at 14 Pisces in the seventh house. My chart ruler and the Titus aspect is my chart ruler, my Mercury at 14 Pisces, squaring my Saturn at 13 Gemini in the 10th. That's the house of Capricorn. So, when you have a tight aspect between Mercury and Saturn, you're probably going to struggle the first half of your life with communication, getting your message across. Uh, you could feel inferior, you could feel intellectually inferior, you could struggle with self-consciousness, um, you're terrified of public speaking. This has been true for me, okay? I've always been terrified of speaking, period, but certainly speaking in public. My stomach is always making noises. I just, I can't avoid it. And that goes along with having the moon in the first house. You're going to have problems with your stomach, digestion, sexy. So, um, I'm not gonna do another take. I forced myself, I don't know why, but I felt intuitively like I needed to force myself out of my shell. I needed to take the risk. And so I made myself take speech and drama in junior high. I was bullied mercilessly by my peers at Goddard Junior High in seventh grade. It was terrible. Seventh grade and eighth grade. Um, I was made fun of because I was shy. I was an easy target. I had a really pale face. I wore bright red lipstick, and my last name was Rainwater. So, I was bullied, but I made myself get on stage. I made myself audition, and I was actually the star of a play when I was in seventh grade, Tessie the Teabag Maker. College, Texas State, San Marcos. I changed my major numerous times. One of my majors was theater arts. I made myself do improv. I made myself get on stage. I was terrified. Um, also, I'm not gonna get into this in this video, but my North Node is in Capricorn. My 
North node and vertex are conjunct. 16 degrees Capricorn in the fifth house. Fifth house is the house of Leo. Leo is all about the stage. One of my earliest dreams when I was a kid was to go to um, Hollywood and be an actress. I also dreamed of going to UCLA Film School. I had a poster of Los Angeles with palm trees and the city lights on my bedroom wall when I was a teenager in Midland, Texas. I basically had all of Vivian Lee's lines and Gone with the Wind memorized. I was obsessed with Scarlett O'Hara and Gone with the Wind. So, it has taken me decades to have enough confidence to really put myself out there by having this YouTube channel and by being on the can on my channel and with clients. This is not my comfort zone. The North Node is anti-comfort zone. Uh, my South Node being in Cancer, like I've said numerous times, I'm more comfortable hiding in the shadows, just staying at home, baking cookies, doing the laundry, writing my little books, reading books, creating art, being with my son. So this is anti-comfort zone. I'm making myself do this. Um, the tightest aspect, chart ruler. My Mercury tightly squaring Saturn in the 10th. So Saturn is at home in the 10th because Saturn rules Capricorn. With Saturn, there is delayed gratification. Uh, nothing handed to you on a silver platter. You're going to work for that shit. You're going to work your ass off if you have Saturn in the 10th. Um, there are people at YouTube who I don't feel like they have earned their success. I don't feel like their content is that valuable. Trish Paytas comes to mind, but she probably doesn't have much with Saturn in her chart. She probably has a really big Jupiter, a Jupiter that makes a lot of aspects because she got instant gratification. She got a lot of followers, a lot of subscribers, relatively quickly. I mean, she's got a fuck ton of money, she's got a mansion, blah, 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 whatever. Trish Paytas. She's just one example of many. There are many people at YouTube who I think their content is basically trash. I don't see the value in it, but they have a fuck ton of followers, subscribers. They have money. That's anti-Saturn. So, with my chart, it's very unlikely that I'll ever have massive success in this lifetime, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about personal relationships, romantic sexual relationships is the focus. Okay. So looking at my chart ruler and the tightest aspect, the Mercury Saturn square, it makes perfect sense to me suddenly why the man I regard as love of my life is just so huge in my mind, why it's almost five years and I've still not completely left go, let go. And I told him once um, on the phone during one of our breaks, I said, I will love you until the day I die. And that's the truth. It makes sense because he's a Capricorn. Okay. Um, he has a lot of squares and oppositions in his natal chart. Communication never flowed between us. It was always very awkward. There was always some misunderstanding between us, constantly. And our Mercuries are square by side, not by aspect. When I look at aspects, I look at tight orbs. The tighter, the better. Five degrees or less, that's a really good aspect. With the wide aspects, and it's really only an aspect if it's 10 degrees or less, but the wider the aspect, the more mediocre the sinistry is going to be. That's my opinion, my belief. Okay, so any reward I got with him in that relationship, I had to work for it. Um, he did not hand me his heart on a silver platter. I had to work. I had to jump through hoops of fire. When we first moved in together, 
February 2013, he told me once, he said, if you ever get fat, I will dump you so fast your head will spin. So the next day, I walked to the dollar store and I bought a jar of peanut butter and a bag of chocolate chips and I would melt the chocolate chips in the microwave and stir them. With the peanut. We were living in a motel room in a border town. I would melt the chocolate chips in the microwave and mix them with the peanut butter. How I thought that was diet food, I don't know. Um, at Wendy's, I would get the salad. Uh, there was a pond, there was a park across the highway from the motel. I would cross the highway and I would walk and jog around the pond. Uh, when we moved back to San Antonio, I joined Planet Fitness and I soon lost 30 pounds. So, I was very much in my body, in my physicality. I would have done anything to keep him, but I never really had him, okay? He said that he loved me, that he was in love with me, but the love that I felt for him was a lot more intense. I feel like I put a lot more into that relationship than he did, but I am so glad that we met. He was a catalyst in my life. Um, he got me to care more about myself. He got me to try harder. He got me to go back to school and he helped me learn basic algebra. He helped me get my degree. I finally got my college degree in my late middle age. So I'm not trying to bash him. I'm trying to use that relationship as an example of how I arrived at this conclusion of why I think the keys to sinistry are the moon, mercury, and chart ruler and its tightest aspect. So, I believe in every relationship. I don't care how shitty the other person is. The person can be a narcissist. The person can be abusive, whatever. We all play our part. We're all complicit. I don't like victim mentality. If you put yourself in the place of a victim, well, then how can you be empowered? You can't come into empowerment if you're going to stay in victim mode. That's how I see it. So anyway, it makes total sense to me why I fell for him so hard and why of all my exes, he's the one who had the most influence on me. He's the one that I loved the hardest, the deepest, the longest. I fell in love with him on December 24th, we met December 23rd. I fell in love, and I can recall the exact moment when I fell in love with him, December 24th, 2012. Okay, here's another illustration. Um, I'm a writer, so my long-term memory is pretty decent. Um, the moment I fell for him, we were in a, Chinese restaurant on Broadway in San Antonio, Christmas Eve, 2012. We were both drunk. We had been drinking for 30 hours. Um, I looked at him, he put on his reading glasses and looked at the bill and that's when I knew I was in love with him. And I can see that with Mercury in the seventh squaring Saturn in the tenth. I'm not articulating this as well as I would like, but that's a pretty serious aspect. With Mercury square Saturn, Mercury especially being in the seventh, Saturn being in the tenth, um, I would say there is a strong possibility you're going to fall for someone who is older, someone who has considerable Capricorn in their chart. You're going to fall for someone who teaches you something. 
someone who is probably a few years older, they have a lot more life experience than you do, or they've had a different life experience than what you've had, and they could teach you something you don't know. Um, and it's not about academia. It's not the kind of knowledge you get in a book. That line from Rehab by Amy Winehouse comes to mind. There's nothing you can teach me that I can't learn from Mr. Hathaway. So, he was my Mr. Hathaway. He was my teacher. He taught me things that I wasn't going to learn in a book or at college. Before I met him, I had crushes on all these guys in the small press, writers, editors, artists, and it was all fruitless. These men didn't really impact my life in any way. I was just living on Facebook and MySpace, and it was just ridiculous. He forced me out into the world, out into the arena. Okay, we're going to catch the bus, and we're going to go here, and we're going to go here. We're going to go to the laundromat. It wasn't glamorous, but Saturn's not about the glamour. It's about the struggle, the deprivation. We're going to go to the plasma bank. We're going to donate plasma. You're going to go back to school, and you're going to get your college degree, and you're going to get off disability. I have been on disability since 2011 for anxiety and depression. My goal for years has been to get off disability and just be totally financially independent. This is the closest I've ever come to reaching that goal, having the channel and reading for clients. So I'm very grateful. I don't take any of this for granted. So. There were times with the Capricorn that tears would come into my eyes because I loved him so much. And that's having Moon in the first house, tightly squaring Neptune and Sagittarius in the fourth. The fourth house, that's the house of Cancer. I felt that love. It was like a Billie Holiday song. You're my thrill, don't explain, my man. Um, crazy he calls me. I felt it. I didn't feel all of my relationships, but I felt that one. So, why the moon? It's like I say in all of my moon readings, trying to explain, because I think I'm the only tarot reader at YouTube who emphasizes the moon in my monthly readings. Everyone else, it's just, oh, if you have Sun, Venus, or whatever, this could be your reading, but, I mean, anyone can watch my moon readings, but, for example, when I'm doing the moon reading for uh, Aries, I specify people who have moon in Aries, but you could have anything in Aries and watch those and get something from a baby. I don't know, but I specify the moon because the moon is your emotions, your feelings, your pain body the baggage, the stuff you carry around, the stuff that you can't shrug off. The moon is not superficial, it's deep. And so I say the moon is a much more heavy hitter. I say the sun, the moon trumps the sun in sinistry because you want to be with someone, ideally, who feeds your soul. That's your moon, that's not your sun. Um, Daily habits and routines. I lived with this one man, a Gemini, who has his moon in Libra, and I did not understand his his habits and routines. He was really weird to me. Um, he didn't eat. That's weird to me because I, I really like food. He didn't eat. Uh, I made him a baked potato once, and he told me not to cook for him. He can cook for himself. Okay, so I made him a baked potato once. That was enough. Um, he drank a lot of coffee and a lot of Red Bull. And he was a chain smoker. 
so that was a big turnoff for me. I thought, I can't really, uh, I can't be with this man. It's not going to work. We're just, we're too different. So that's why you tend to see couples who smoke together, you know, they drink together, they have the same daily habits and routines. It's very rare. I mean, it happens, but um, I would say it's rare for someone to be in a lifelong relationship or a long-term relationship if one person is a raw vegan and the other person is an omnivore or a carnivore or one person is a junkie or a, a tweaker or an alcoholic and the other person is very pristine and they're all about um, clean living, veganism, yoga, whatever. It happens, I guess, but I would say it's pretty rare. Usually when people are in a successful, harmonious relationship that lasts, they're going to be in a similar way of life. You know, they'll work out together, they'll do yoga together, they'll have basically the same feelings about food and just lifestyle in general. You know, some people, it doesn't bother them having a big ass television in the den, a television that's always on. Some people are okay with constant noise. I'm not. I like to have my peace and quiet. I like to have my binaural beats, my white noise. I like to get away from technology sometimes. I like to take breaks from my channel and not just constantly be on my phone. I think it's very toxic. It's very unhealthy to be in constant noise. So I could not be with a man. I could not share a home with a man who constantly has the television on or he's always playing loud music or he's always on his phone. No. So that's the moon. And then Mercury is communication. It's extremely important to me because Mercury is my chart ruler. So communication, if I'm with a man and um, we're in a long distance relationship and there's not pretty consistent communication, I can't do that. Because I'll be wondering constantly, why is he not blowing up my phone? What's going on? And in a way, that's for me being a codependent and a love addict in recovery. It's not healthy, but healthy or not, I need constant communication or consistent communication, certainly if we're in a long distance relationship. Um, that's one of the reasons why I fell for my first husband, because we met online in 2000, before Facebook and all of that. Um, we met at Yahoo Personals. He was looking for a pen pal in the Southwest. He was in New York, I was in Texas. And we both contributed poems to this poetry website. So he fell for me on the basis of a couple of photographs in my poetry. And I fell for him. Um, I liked hearing his New York accent on the phone. That's a, an, another thing with Mercury um, in the seventh. I would say that you're probably going to be attracted to someone's voice, how they sound on the phone, and the communication plays a very big part, at least initially in the relationship. So. Uh, we had telephone marathons. We would talk for literally eight hours at a time. He would clock in to work. He was the overnight manager to Barnes and Noble in New York. He would clock in, go into the office, and he would talk to me for his entire shift. And I liked that. I needed that. So we were both writers. We both loved books. And you'll see that, I would say, with Mercury in the seventh. You want to be with someone that um, you can collaborate with creatively. But with Mercury in the seventh, you're not going to be happy in a relationship that's just sex. There has to be some mind stuff. It has to be a meeting of the minds with Mercury in the seventh, I would say. And certainly, Mercury squaring Saturn <clears throat> in the 10th, no less, you cannot be with someone you don't respect. You can't be with someone you deem idiotic. You can't be with someone you deem mindless. It's not going to be enough. I don't care if the guy is ripped as fuck. I don't care if he's Brad Pitt. 
if you aren't speaking the same language, if you're not on the same page, if you're not in sync, if you don't respect the person intellectually, it's not going to be substantial. It's not going to last. So, um, that's my stuff. These glasses are smudged as hell. So the subscribers chart. Her moon is at 22 Scorpio in the 12th. It makes an exact square to her Mercury at 22 Aquarius in the 3rd. Okay. So moon and Scorpio. When you fall in love, it's hard and so you don't do shallow. You're not going to fall in love with someone on the basis of their looks. There's that initial attraction and looks play a part, but it's going to be hard and so it's going to be deep. You're going to be loyal. Um, you're not about the shallow and the superficial. You want someone who fucks with your mind a little bit. Moon, square, Mercury. Okay. Moon, square, Mercury. Her Mercury at 22 Aquarius in the third, which is the house of Gemini. That's all about communication. Um, it's tricky because her moon in Scorpio is in the 12th, the house of Pisces. That's the most private house. You have a private moon in a private house, double privacy, okay? You may want to, you may find yourself spying on someone before you get deep, you know, looking at their stuff on social media, seeing what this person is all about. Um, you may even hire someone to do a deep dive on this person. You are not going to be all in hard and so until you can trust this person. Um, you don't fall in love easily. You have to really get to know someone. You have to feel that you can really trust them. And you absolutely have to respect their mind with Moon, Square, Mercury. You are witty. You're good with language. But that whole thing of going back and forth, sending pictures, flirting on social media, that's not really it for you. If you could, you would just skip the preliminaries and get right into the deep stuff, the deep life and death conversations. Uh, I looked into this for more clarification and it said with the 12th house, you may find success in past life regression therapy because you could have stuff from a past life that's really fucking with you in this life. That's the 12th house. Okay. Um, it's really deep. With Pisces in general, there tends to be a blurring of boundaries. Where do you begin and where does the other person end? The boundaries become blurred with Pisces in the 12th house. It bothers me. I put on makeup and I see all these flaws and the eyeliner gets smudged and it just bothers me. I really don't get these YouTubers where it's just, it's perfection. I can't relate.
unfinished business from previous lifetimes. You probably have a propensity for getting into these really complicated, seemingly impossible situations. Feeling like it can never work because of A, because of B. It could be third party, multiple party. Uh, distance could be a factor. It could be all sorts of things, but you probably don't want something easy. This is not the energy of someone who just falls in love on the basis of a Facebook profile or you get all excited, you get all hot and bothered over someone's credit score, <laughs> their Instagram, you know. Um, it's not Barbie and Ken. It's not the Brady Bunch. Um, you kind of want to go through hell. You may not think that you do. It may be unconscious, but you kind of want to go through hell. And, you know, crash and burn and then rise like the phoenix, rise from the ashes in a relationship. You want to see how deep someone will go. How deep will you go? You'll go pretty deep with a chart like this. So, this is not the energy of someone who just meets someone at a bar or on tent or whatever and then you fall in love and you get married six months or a year later. I see a lot of um, obstacles and bumps on the road. Chart ruler, Pluto, because the ascendant is 24 Scorpio, so Pluto is the chart ruler. It's in the 10th house. That's the house of Capricorn. Um, so Pluto at 9 Virgo squares tight. Venus at 10 Aquarius in the 3rd. Okay. You're going to be adept at communication and you want that in a partner, someone who is adept at communication, someone who is really fucking smart, someone who is savvy, someone who is confident, someone who um, doesn't just talk a bunch of bullshit. They go out and they make things happen in the world. Someone who is accomplished. It's not about money. It's about respect. It's about integrity. It's about character. So Pluto squaring Venus, tight, 9 Virgo, 10 Aquarius, the 10th and the 3rd. You're going to get into power struggles, prove yourself, you're telling your person, prove it, prove yourself. Uh, someone who just talks a bunch of bullshit, they're not going to have any weight with you. Um, they have to back it up. They have to back up whatever it is. And the people who are the most accomplished, the greatest people, the greatest artists, filmmakers, writers, whatever, they don't talk a bunch of bullshit. They don't have to go around and blow their own horn. They just show up and they show that they know their stuff. They're good at what they're good at. So, you have a really good bullshit detector. You know when someone's lying to you. You know when someone's not giving you their all. You know when someone's just half-assing it, and you don't have any tolerance for that. If they're not going to be in hard and so, you don't have any use for them. So, Those are your dominant houses, I would say the 12th, the house of Pisces, 3rd, Gemini, and 10th, Capricorn. So there's some fluidity, there's some flow, but there's also this brick wall, the resistance of the, this, the 10th house, that's Capricorn. That's the brick wall, that's the resistance, that's the go no further. I'm hearing 
Stand Back by Stevie Nicks. You demand respect. Your intuition is really fucking sharp. You can see through people. And you're not going to be with someone who doesn't have any self-respect. You're not going to be with someone who hasn't proven their worth. How is someone worthy to you? How do you deem someone worthy? Well, they have to be smart. They have to be capable. They have to be confident. Um, there can't be any artifice. So that's what I have. I'm interested to get feedback on this video. I want to know if I'm hitting the mark here, if I'm on to something. I'm doing this research because I have a purpose. I've never heard another astrologer talk about these three things specifically when it comes to sinistry. You hear Mars, Venus all day long. Sun, Moon, that's a very common um, aspect that people talk about. The Sun-Moon conjunction. I'm interested in the Moon, Mercury, and the chart ruler and the chart ruler's Titus aspect. I think I'm on to something here. That's why I invited subscribers to submit their charts to me because I want to do these videos, a series. I was going to do just one video. That's insane. There's no way I could cram it all into one video. It's going to be a series, but I want to see if I'm really on to something here and if I'm reading these charts correctly. I mean, it's easy to read mine. I've been myself for almost 48 years. I know my life. I know my history, but... By reading these charts of strangers, I'm seeing how good I am at this. Uh, I still have a long way to go. I don't consider myself an expert. What the fuck? I'm very much an amateur because I've only been going deep since 2014. And by deep, I mean looking at the aspects of degrees. Before that, I thought, oh, well... I'm an Aquarius, this man is a Gemini, so we're compatible. No. You have to go deeper. You have to look at the orbs. And I truly believe, I maintain that for lasting happiness and success in a romantic sexual relationship, you have to look at the moon, the mercury, and the chart ruler in its tightest aspect. That's what I have. I hope that helps. Thank you all so much for watching, liking, commenting, subscribing and sharing, sending you a massive love and light from San Antonio.